including a month dedicated to divine love. Yeah. You know, it's funny how, you know, this is the last Sunday in February. Mm -hmm. Next month, you got Easter, I think it's the last Sunday in March. And by the time you get to the Women's Month, Men's Month, take a vacation, come back for anniversary month, and say, you October month, November, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and year ago. and <laughs> 
sued the Avenue Railroad Company. They won the suit. And his daughter Elizabeth, with his help, desegregated public transportation in New York a hundred years before Rosa Parks set out and didn't get it. And not to leave the sisters out, the first African American woman to get a patent was Judy W. Reed. She invented the kneading machine. Now they say Judy could not write her own name. But divine love gave her a way to literally roll in the dough. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to give a little celebration to not just them, but to all of us of a dark hue who have made so many great contributions to this world and get so accolades and mentions for doing so. Right. And I have to be perfectly honest with you. Before me doing a little probing this week, I had no idea who Thomas Jenkins was. Mm -hmm. okay. So that says to me that all of us need to spend a little more time seeking out who we truly are mm -hmm. and what we truly are and what contributions yeah. we have made to this life because he needs to know. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And if we don't know, we can't tell him. So let's get to our message. Divine love. Let's review, if you will, what we've discussed this month. We've discussed how God's divine love can turn situations that were meant to glorify the outer material side of life into a celebration that acknowledges our spiritual truth. Divine love turns this outer experience into an inner spiritual experience that proclaims only the Christ consciousness can reveal your hidden truth. Only love through Christ can inspire the attainment of your maximum potential. Only divine love can fuel your thought to produce unlimited supply. We all are quick to say God is love, but we all need to understand that you are the image and likeness of that love, but you can only become that love if you believe and accept his love. You see, just like the master teacher Jesus, he was the master teacher of divine love, but you must believe that divine love can and will supply what? Your every need. His word promises unlimited substance and supply. <clears throat> Divine love gives you the spiritual power to overcome all things. Divine love exposes you to a spiritual truth that has more value than any material possession. Divine love needs no need of rituals or material sacrifices to make it whole and to make it a part of your life. All it needs is just for you to love God and love one another as you would have those love you. But in this life that we live, even though we know we are descendants of this unconditional, divine, agape love, stuff happens. We have challenges. Sometimes we think that maybe God's divine love is not all that there is. Sometimes we feel that even though we've done our homework, we've done our prayer work, we, 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 we attend church on a regular basis and we do everything we can to extend and open our home to everybody, stuff just doesn't seem to go our way. Yes. Yes. But your challenges, your disappointments, and your setbacks don't exist because of, because of a lack of God's love. They exist as opportunities for you to recognize and demonstrate his love in spite of what you're going through. Hello. You see, you're always on your way somewhere. That's right. And it's the light of love that will guide you through the darkness. Yes. You know, since I have removed myself from the, what I call the corporate grind of America, I try not to get up and get out into that heavy traffic that those of you who have jobs have to do. <laughs> if I need to make an appointment, I'm going to try to make it at the team. <laughs> but there is an occasion when I have to get up early, yeah. and I have to get out there in the traffic with all of y'all. And when that happens, I tend to turn on the radio, and I end up hearing uh, Steve Harvey's opening statement. 
state home. And we've talked about Steve before, and you know, he, he's a funny comedian, and he's got a whole lot going on, but those opening statements that he makes at the beginning of his show are very powerful. Yeah. They're very meaningful, and you can tell he's speaking from his heart. You can tell he's speaking from his own experience, and even though he's got plenty of money, more jobs than he can get to. <laughs> Stuff happens in his life that causes him to want to share that circumstance and how to move through it with us. So Steve, this particular morning, he was talking about how, you know, you're on your way somewhere. You made a decision and you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, as they will, and you, you're walking the walk and you're talking the talk and everything is going just fine. But then there's people. And sometimes there's situations. And oftentimes it's our own fear and our own insecurities that shake our faith. The Bible identifies that interference as the devil's work. But sometimes we can be on the right track, but we can, we can tell ourselves that this is the year we're going to write that book, but yet we procrastinate and find ways to just do busy work so you don't have time to get it done. You know, we can, we can go through the 12-step program and relieve ourselves of all our addictions, but sometimes we'll walk into a room where they're in there having a good time party and we'll get overexcited about what we used to do and end up to be. You see, sometimes we decide that we're going to leave the street lights and we're going to get us a good job and to take care of our families and our, and our homes without having to worry about getting arrested. But every once in a while, the bills get a little too much to handle. So we decide we're going to just try it one more time and buy one more kilo and see if we can make a little extra money. Sometimes life makes us want to turn our back on God's promise because we seek to embrace the rewards of immediate gratification. But ultimately, we have to walk on through the storm. Ultimately, you must know that God loves you enough to see you through all the obstacles that's blocking your path. As Reverend Lisa has been telling us, just like Earth, Wind, and Fire told us, it's all about love. Everywhere we, we are, there's nothing but love. Every time we think, everything we say, everything we do should be predicated on God's divine love. But when stuff happens, as Reverend Lisa told us, we get bamboozled. <laughs> we believe that there's a power other than. And like Steve Harvey was telling his listeners, we have to reawaken ourselves to the truth that God got you. Yeah. And then after we reawaken to ourselves to the truth, we have to keep repeating that mantra so we'll stay awake. Yeah. You see and understand that the opposition only has the power that you give. Come on. You see, love is always in full effect. But you have the choice to believe it or not. Yeah. Reverend Lisa reminded us of the ants and how they have a challenge just for daily survival. And it required them to come together, bond together, and form a unit that can't drown, that can float on the water that's invading their colony. But they can only do that if they come together in love and trust and believe in one another. Because this ant colony is the only world that they know. So they're trying to survive by coming together and unifying as one power and one presence. But what do you think would happen if the ants had political parties? <laughs> what do you think would happen if they focused on their religious differences? <laughs> what would happen to the ants if their cultural biases got in the way? <laughs> their survival would be in serious jeopardy. And she was tired of refereeing at church. Well, well. She loves her job and she loves all of you. Mm -hmm. But she just wishes that me and the rest of y'all would practice what you preach. Well. You see, the only reason differences exist is because we refuse to demonstrate the power of unconditional. 
unconditional love. Mm -hmm. God is the greatest scientist that ever lived. And in his creation, he made sure that it all began as one, that it all came from one. And eventually, if we exude the divine love that created us, we will all become what? One. You know, I used to be what people would call radical, what people would call a black nationalist. I used to believe, truly believe, that anybody that didn't look like me was in fact the devil. And they were out to persecute me, treat me bad, do me wrong, and I had no shot unless I was to eliminate that opposition. So I was a street fighter. Wore the green jackets, black leather jackets, sometimes the beret, and then I would put on my bow tie. You know, my brother was the national secretary for the nation of Islam. So I had all three days covered, Panthers, us, and Muslims. at that time was one that saw opposition. But now that my consciousness is wrong, I know there's no opposition. Because God designed this thing in a way that if we just do as he asked us to do, we just love each other unconditionally, we all got to come back to the one. Because he scientifically made it so that this Melanin was the dominant gene, period. Right. So if all of us just decide we're going to love each other unconditionally, if everybody who looked like us decided they were going to get with somebody who looked like them, over time there would be no issue of color. That's right. Now I don't know if you're paying attention, really. But if you, you might watch college basketball, yeah. if you're paying attention, most of the superstars in college basketball today come from biracial colors. <laughs> pay attention. I also want you to pay attention to yeah. the media, the TV commercials that you see now. You never saw TV commercials with black and brown couples and or they got it all mixed up now. Why? Because the consciousness of people are changing. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be with ourselves and stick together. Our culture, our communities will make that the predominant choice. But what I'm saying, we should have no fear. We shouldn't do as they do. The reason why all these, you know, white supremacist groups exist is because they know they weak. They know that if they treat us right and come with us, that they don't. They will be eliminated. So we don't have to have that fear. We don't have to have that hatred in our hearts. We can open our arms up and love everybody all the time. Because at the end of the day, everybody wants to stand with us. We're getting back to the message. <laughs> Last time, I made a mistake. 
is actually John 4, 7 through 12. But that passage told us that we must know spiritual love before we can express brotherly love. And we have to practice brotherly love before we can enjoy passionate love. You see, spiritual love allows us to know God. Brotherly love allows us to express God, and passionate love allows us to feel God. But they're all aspects of divine love. In our last message, I talked about Mary Magdalene. Here is a consciousness that evolved from a self-centered person, a person motivated by carnal desires and immediate gratification. She evolved into a devoted, unconditionally loving person in full recognition of her indwelling Christ. She became that part of us that's willing to lose all ego and pride. She became that part of us that had no problem demonstrating our love and no problem speaking our love. You know, the feminine side doesn't mind saying I love you. Us guys, we got issues. It's hard. Got to be pride out of us. But this feminine expression that the Bible identifies as Mary Mac, she decided to surrender her personality. She decided to rise up to a spiritual understanding that accepts the everlasting life of her divine creation. She represents that part of us that's humble, caring, and devoted and true to our original nature. That's why 70% of the pews today are filled with women. Because they have no problem accepting and surrendering to the Christ. But likewise, guys, us masculine side, we have to be transformed as well by the renewing of our mind. And the Bible identifies individuals who lead us through that transformation. John the Baptist is such an individual. They say that John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Christ. Some even thought that he was the Messiah himself. Because the Messiah was said to come, as you know, from a virgin birth. And Elizabeth was far beyond the years of being able to bear a child. But she had an immaculate conception nonetheless. And from that birth came an intellectual reasoning consciousness that was motivated by love, but yet it was a little bit prone to judgment. You know, that pure, divine, unconditional love is sit what you want to sit over there. <laughs> in the presence of Reverend Lisa, standing before you is John the Baptist. <laughs> to do right. But sometimes we don't allow ourselves to be quickened by the spirit. We represent that grandpa used to represent that tough love. You know, grandpa would get, get to you and grandma would be trying to hide you so you wouldn't get that switch. <laughs> but John the Baptist came with a purpose. And that purpose was the washing away of our material dependency and preparation for a spiritual awakening. You see, the art of baptism completes the transformation of thought pertaining to our mental, moral, and physical expression. It focuses on our righteous behavior. It teaches us moral values, and it's always seeking to be like Spike Lee and do the right thing. But sometimes it condemns the evils of society. Sometimes it, it, it speaks against the moral values of others, and, and, and it makes you want to punish them for the works that they do. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the prominent consciousness that exists throughout the ruling governments then, and it persists even today. You see, the big boys that call the shots and have all the money, they pass judgment on lesser societies, but they forget to do unto the others that you would have them do unto you. They tell you to do what I say. They tell you to believe what I say. And if you think differently than I tell you, you're going to have some consequences. Right. But that type of mentality as it is in our society today is always met with resistance. That's why the Bible says John had to be put in prison. The intellect had to be hidden up 
because it was bound by magnifying the evils and sins of the world. You see, when you give negative things too much emphasis and power, it paralyzes your efforts. It stymies everything you want to do in your life because you're too busy pointing out what's wrong with everything and everybody else. I don't know how many focus right now are being filled with what the devil's going to do to you and that you just alone and sinner, you have no control. That ain't the truth. No. You see, when you give things that are negative too much power, yes. you end up in a bad place. You see, John the Baptist, he decided that he was going to call attention to all of Herod's misgivings. You know, Herod had some stuff that he wasn't a little kosher about. Had plenty of women, decided he wanted his brother's wife. Mm. John said, oh, no, 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 no. He called him out in public. Mm. Humiliated. Mm. So the daughter of the woman that he was messing with said, I don't like him for blasting to my mama. I want his head on a platter. Mm -hmm. So John was presented to him with his head on a platter. Mm -hmm. You see that temporary overzealous righteousness to control material in the physical plane must die before spiritual enlightenment can occur. John 3 and 30, John himself said, he must increase and I must decrease. And likewise, Jesus said in Luke 7 and 28, there's no greater born of a woman, yet the least in the kingdom is greater than he. What these passages are telling us that the least of a spiritual thought is greater than the reasoning thought of intellect only. And the intellect must give way to spiritual understanding, and that spiritual understanding can only come through the Holy Spirit. You see, the water baptism is a starting point, but we must be baptized by the fire of spiritual truth, because fire consumes all sense and materiality. So John's water baptism is the sense mind being cleansed and awakened to its mental potential so you can think right and do right. But the fire baptism of Jesus is the creative law of divine mind lighting a fire at the center of your being, purifying your soul and your body. The Holy Spirit, the quickening of the spiritual nature, is God's offering to all of us. It is the greatest spiritual gift that we've been given. That's why the preacher tells you when you are washed in the blood of Jesus, what he's telling you is you will receive the spiritual energy that purifies and redeems all. 1 John 5 and 6 says, Jesus the Christ came not by water only, but by water and blood. Amen. So you see, no matter how righteous one appears on the outside, without a spiritual inner cleansing, God's divine love cannot be revealed. The intellect, John the Baptist, prepared the way for the Christ, the spiritual consciousness of Jesus. Divine love is inspired by spirit, not by intellectual reasoning. John the Baptist's consciousness must evolve to that of John the Apostle, one that recognizes and becomes merciful, gracious, and compassionate. Spiritual love that gives freely with zeal, yet tempered by understanding. You see, we, when we evolved, when I evolved, from instructing and judging others, and focused more on the harmonizing of my inner self, then I will be all that God has me to be. Now, I'm not the only one, I'm sure, that needs to focus on that. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. God's greatest example of divine love in this human expression is something called marriage. You can't talk about divine love for a whole month and not talk about marriage. Marriage was ordained by Christ 
But marriage is the union of two dominant states of consciousness. I know y'all thought it was a ceremony where rings were exchanged and all the bridesmaids looked the same and that wedding gown had a train to the body. I know that's your image of marriage. But marriage, once again, is the union of two dominant states of consciousness. It's the coming together of a man and a woman. It's the melding and blending of ego and emotion. It's the complement of wisdom and love. It is bringing the higher self and the lower self together in harmony to understand that we're all one and we're all guided by the power and presence of divine love. You see, this union of marriage can only happen when the I am, which is your spiritual self, is poured out in everything that you do and everything that you say. Because it allows spirit to govern over your personal will. It allows those 12 spiritual principles to reign in harmony inside your body, which is your church. It allows two or more to come together in his name. It allows our opposing thoughts to find mutual understanding. Now, you know, I do a whole lot of weddings. And most of the time, in today's society, they want to, like, modify it, write their own Bibles. Because a lot of women, you know, ain't too cool with the obey part. <laughs> so they kind of shift and change. <laughs> but the reason why women and men are looking to express it differently is because they don't have the true understanding of what is being said. You see, it, it reads this way. It says, submit yourselves to one another in the love of Christ. I'm reading from Ephesians 5, 21 through 25. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to our Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as the Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved his church and gave himself to it. Now I can understand if that a little bit little understanding might not sit well with some of y'all. I get it. Let me give you a different view. Verse 21 says, simply submit unconditionally. Don't have any, well, I'm going to stay if. I'm only going to put up with so much. Because if you commit to yourself, you're going to put up and deal with whatever you have to deal with to stay committed, not to them, but to yourself. Then it says, wives, submit as unto the Lord. What that's saying is your feminine personality self, and then you have a feminine personality self as well. Your feminine personality self must be in harmony with the masculine under the law. Why? Because you need wisdom, strength, right. will, and power in order for you to maintain love, faith, understanding, and imagination. If you just allow yourself to just love them without any wisdom, you're going to find yourself broke out, out, out living them on the street somewhere with nothing. But that love has to be balanced with some wisdom. That faith has to have some strength, otherwise you'll waver and you'll turn back on God's promise. You see, do it as he is, as Christ is, which says Christ supplies what's necessary for the spiritual body to work in harmony. That spiritual body individually and collectively must allow Christ to lead, must allow the feminine faculties that are more effective when they are led by or combined with a masculine quality. 
quality. That's all the scripture is telling us. And then the most important part is the last part that gets overlooked the most. And he's talking to the husbands. He says, husbands, you must surrender yourself and be tempered by your feminine side. And then you got to drop that ego. Mm -hmm. And that is my way or the highway. Right, and you have to have some feeling and some compassion yes. and some understanding mm -hmm. as to what their perspective is. Mm -hmm. And you have to give that just as much or not more consideration than your own. Why? Because that's what Christ did for the church. He surrendered all for the church. He, didn't, he wasn't puffed up and you can't do this, you can't do what you will to me. Because I am a product of divine love that can't be put asunder. I am going to rise again and become even more powerful than I was before you did whatever you did. Yes. So you see, when you understand marriage a little differently, you don't have a problem with anybody. Because you know the crux of the bound is that in order for you to be all that you can be, divine love has to unite you with everything that you think is the opposite of you. Everything that you dislike about someone else, you could not dislike it about them unless that quality existed in you. And if you really look at the things that are getting on your nerves, it's that same quality that provides that thing that gets on your nerves that provides another quality of protection for you. So don't get all uptight, young ladies. <laughs> when it says obey your husband. Because the truth is, when that leg comes through the window, you're not going to tap him on the shoulder and say, baby, I got this. You're going to say, Ralph, get up and deal with this. She was an example of how we could allow a lower self. She's an example of this marriage that we're talking about. She allowed the lower self to commune with the higher self. John the Baptist, he sacrificed his judgmental, willful self to embrace the compassion and understanding of truth, which is revealed in scripture as the apostle John, the one that was under the tutelage of the Christ. A spiritual marriage is when divine love is manifested and the results of that spiritual marriage is an eternal cleansing. I call that eternal cleansing CKLS. <laughs> Some of y'all know what that is. Yes, yes. But in this case, C represents the consciousness of Christ that must be embraced. K represents the knowledge of Christ that must be revealed. L represents the love of Christ that must be demonstrated. And S is the spirit of Christ that must be embodied. You know, this book is full of conversations about love. But Paul, in one of his letters to the Corinthians, probably laid it out as eloquently and as clearly as anybody ever did in chapter 13 of First Corinthians. Paul was a preacher at this time. And he was probably standing on a podium. And he was telling the parishioners, he said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love in my heart, I am become as a sounding brass or tingling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and have all the knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains mm -hmm. and have that love in my heart, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love in my heart, I gain nothing. Love is 
long suffering and kind. Love does not envy. Love does not make vain display of itself and does not boast. Does not behave itself unseemingly. Seeks not its own and is not easily provoked and thinks no evil. Divine love rejoices not over iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Divine love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Divine love never fails, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there shall be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, when divine love comes, then that which is imperfect shall come to an end. When I was a child, mm -hmm. I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I became fully mature, I put away childish things. For we now see through a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I will know. And now abide in faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Paul was being very clear about divine love being all that's necessary to live the life that God would have you live. Paul tells us in that first verse, he says, I can express truth clearly, but if I don't have love, even though I mean well, all I'm going to be doing is making difference. He says, I can preach a good sermon. I can give you a metaphysical understanding. I can demonstrate the faith to endure all challenges. But if I don't have love in my heart, I have nothing. He says, I can be the philanthropist. I can give to the needy. I can study and understand and get a fire baptism and purify my body. I can give up all my carnal ways, but if I have love, if I don't have love, I gain nothing. He says because divine love is tolerant. Divine love has no envy. Divine love is not conceited, nor does it break. Divine love is well behaved, it's disciplined, and it's positive. Divine love is moral, fair, and truthful. Divine love is accepting, trusting, hopeful, and everlasting. Yes. You see, what's said may change. What you think you know, you may forget. Yes. But divine love will always remain. Yes. You see, we only know so much, so we can only teach so much. But the perfection of divine love removes all imperfections in our life. You see, there was a time when I didn't know. There was a time when I was a babe in this thing called life. There was a time that I didn't know, but now I know, so I do differently. Yes. Because I have come into the light. I'm looking in a dim mirror, but that light shines through that allows me to see the God in others, and more importantly, the God in me. <laughs> you see, the evidence of things unseen, which is our faith. The optimistic of a great future. Love is the answer. Love is the only thing is that can be the best thing that you can do and the best thing that the world can give to one another. You see, when you express the divine love of God, you are expressing the image and likeness that creates you. You are expressing that individual that may have started out walking back but decided that life would be a lot grander if they took a few steps forward. Yes. And while they were walking towards the mark, while they were looking to achieve that that God had put on their heart and their mind to achieve in their life, somebody put a roadblock in front of them. 
That roadblock might be a pink slip. You just got fired. Mm -hmm. That roadblock might be a letter on the dresser saying I'm gone and I'm not coming back. Mm -hmm. That roadblock might be a letter from the bank saying all your stuff is frozen. Mm -hmm. That roadblock could be anything that makes you think that God's love doesn't have your back. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to keep walking, if you're able to keep trusting, if you're able to keep having faith in that which created you, the letter be rewritten. And it'll say, you got the loan. It'll say, baby, I'm coming back. I'm sorry. I left. <laughs> it'll open up the door for you to step beyond that rock or take a hammer and just chisel away at that rock little by little until it dissolves in front of you. Yes. 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 Always has and always will supply your every need.